Weekend update, June 7, 2020. It's been a good week, I think, as I'm still motivated and enjoying studying Korean. I stumbled on MIA Matt's old video about him talking about his AJAT experience. He literally sat down and decided to just go over and sum up everything in one video, in one go, and just started talking. Three hours later, he was done, sort of. I'm working from home and it was kind of slow, so I just watched it while I worked mostly and finished it up after work. It's not the first stupid long video about language learning I've watched. I am a sucker for this stuff. Seabolt Speaks is one of my new favorite channels. As is typical, I was influenced by some of what he said. First of all, AJAT, or all Japanese all the time, may have put a few personal spins on language learning, but he's not the first person by any means to try to learn a language by, well, doing everything in that language as much as possible. I did that with German way back in the day, and I know many other language learners did similar things. Everyone's approach, of course, was a bit different, and Ajat incorporated Anki into his method and got very good results, and I think he might be the first one to start an online internet cult for language learning. Anyway, so Matt talked about what he did and his experiences with Japan. I think his experiences had a lot in common with many other Westerners trying to assimilate into the culture and, well, not having it be quite what they hoped for despite a lot of hard work. But that's not Japan's fault, and Matt later said that he was depressed when he made the video, so it emphasizes the bad more than it should. But I didn't think it was all bad, even if he was dwelling on the bad a bit more than people usually would, especially if they care about offending people and the culture, etc. I was super impressed with what he achieved and, of course, curious about his routine. I should have written down exactly what he did, but essentially it was Japanese all the time as much as possible. And he was a high school student and then a college student, so he had a lot of control over how he spent his time. It was a lot of Japanese. He says he started his day waking up early to do Anki reps. It was about two hours. This two hours of Anki seems to be a magic number of sorts with people that really push Anki to the limit. He focused on immersion right away, even as a beginner, turning off the subs and watching anime without really understanding a thing at first. He went to Japanese high school, but was barely conversational it seems, and didn't enjoy socializing at all as a result, and spent as much time alone as possible studying Japanese, reading light novels even though they were very hard and making Anki cards. The most enjoyable time he had in Japan at that time was teaching English. He was a sort of teacher's assistant in the high school English class and dropped all his other subjects to do that as he couldn't understand the other classes anyway. And then he worked as a counselor at a camp for a couple weeks teaching English and really enjoyed it. His host family thought he was weird, just studying all the time instead of spending time with them. They thought he would learn Japanese better being with them but Matt didn't think so. I don't know who was right. I do know that when I was in Germany and later Japan and sucked at the languages or at least couldn't keep up with the natives, I wanted to study by myself too in order to get better. He left Japan ahead of schedule as he wasn't happy in Japan and thought he could just self-immerse at home anyway and be happier. And he was right. Anyway, his story is pretty interesting and if you're into Japanese, his video is a very good watch. I wonder how he got so many views. Just because it's interesting, maybe? Uh, who knows how YouTube works? Well, back to his method. He really felt that I plus one was very important and suggested making 10 to 15 new sentence cards a day and no more. He says that towards the end of his studying, he started breaking the I plus one rule and regretted it as it made him made doing Anki reviews a lot more difficult. He talked about how the idea is to get a hook for a word in your head and then adding a definition for a word was much easier. I guess that's where Anki helps out. I tend to agree that getting a hook in your head or a word in your dictionary in your head is the hard part so that your brain stops tuning this word out when it hears it and then once it stops filtering the word out, then you will start to learn what the heck it means afterwards. So I'm kind of playing with the idea of waking up early to do Anki reviews. I wouldn't want to wake up a full two hours earlier. I think I've talked about my sleeping difficulties already, 
And so this might not be a good idea, but I'm curious and want to try it out. Today, I have done about two hours of Anki. It's Saturday, so that's not a big deal for me. Actually, I adjusted how Anki counts time. It was set to stop counting at 60 seconds before, but I sometimes spend a few minutes on a card, particularly if I am looking up words in a sentence on Papago or Neighbor. I fixed that, so hopefully it counts correctly. I guess if I put it too high and then accidentally fall asleep while doing Anki, it won't stop counting or something. I don't really know why that setting is there. When I was learning German through immersion, I focused mostly on reading. It's natural to look up words while you're reading, but weird if you're listening to a podcast or audio book even. I did listen to tons of German, but only while I was doing something else, mostly playing EverQuest, an online MMO, or working at my job where I did data entry or doing anything really, cleaning, exercising, commuting. I'm working from home, so there's no commute. I don't clean enough. I might try to work that into my study routine, but this would not be reliable. So I'm going to have to make myself do some listening. I watched one hour of Goblin, the K-drama, without subs tonight. I know the characters already since I've been watching it with subs, so it wasn't too terrible. I'm going to say I understood about 5% of the Korean, but it might have been less. Thankfully, they didn't just sit on their butts talking to each other, but actually did stuff so I could watch them and get the gist of things. The hour went by pretty quickly. I hope this continues. I got back into Link again, and I'm continuing Harry Potter Book 1. I'm about one-third of the way through now. I will probably be doing a lot of reading with Link in the near future, so I may complain about the app. It has its shortcomings. But I'm happy to see that after clicking many words, a lot of pages are mostly white instead of all blue-yellow words like before. That's a nice effect, I think, of the app. I can sort of see the progress by looking at the lack of colors on the page. One shortcoming is that you can't copy and paste text from the website. Really? What the heck? I changed my mind about native material and I want to copy 10 sentences a day from Harry Potter into Anki. I'm not so big on I plus one, but there's another rule Matt had that I might break but really don't want to. He says you need to understand the sentence, well, after looking up the words. Sometimes you don't. That's actually pretty often for me, but it seems to be noticeably improving. It helps that I know Harry Potter already, for sure. He's already pretty big on the whole monolingual thing, or also, I am for it if I can get a good language learner's dictionary. I did reach a point with Japanese where I usually understood the definition of a word looking it up in a Japanese dictionary, but sometimes I only partly understood and maybe didn't even realize my understanding was vague or off a little until after I'd reviewed the card a few times. Matt really liked his ability to remember actual Japanese definitions. I don't think my memory is so good that I would be quoting the dictionary very much, so I don't see that as a plus. I'm probably going to stick with bilingual dictionaries, at least for the rest of this year, since I'm using sentences. I also like having an English sentence translation on side too. It really gives a nice context in my head to associate with the target vocabulary and the sentence. Of course, I know Matt had a lot of success, so I may reconsider this later. It would be nice to duplicate his success. Then again, he only studied one language, although dabbling in Chinese a little, but didn't get too far from what I understand. I think that helps a lot. I find having so many languages in my head does wear me out and make it a bit less sharper than it otherwise could be. Oh, I started another K-pop song deck again. The last time I just grabbed sentences and mixed them right into my main sentence deck. That sentence deck basically got too many leeches, not just from K-pop, but also from me getting excited about the example sentences in Naver a while back. But songs have crazy grammar, spellings, and are probably a terrible way to really learn the language. They are good to have fun with though, but I think you need to be careful. So I'm keeping the deck separate so as not to contaminate my real deck. And I'm using the real audio from the songs and importing it into Anki. It's a little time consuming, but so worth it. Then lastly, I'm not doing sentences. Songs don't really have sentences anyway, as there's not much grammar. It's more like stanzas in a poem or a paragraph maybe. Anyway, when they sing a bit, before stopping to rest or whatever, there's breaks, and it's usually about four lines of script in the lyrics. 
with the actual music on the card, not chopped up into sentences, but in the stanzas so that it flows properly, the cards really come to life. Definitely not I plus one though. They are truly begging to be leeches, but they literally sing to me. Anyway, that's, uh, that's it for this update. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.